Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Li Ming Chen. I'm from China. Um, I feel really honored to give this talk here. And I would like to introduce my user experience on Open Delight. Here's the content. And I just want to show how I used Open Delight and uh, what I feel from Open Delight. First, why I chose Open Delight and why I insist on Open Delight. Actually, I was chosen. I didn't choose Open Delight. The first time I used Open Delight is because of a project. My supervisor arranged me to develop Open Delight. I was really driven crazy. As you know that the first release, Hydrogen, um, it is not user friendly. Uh, but you see that today I stand here and try to convince people to use Open Delight. So what happened? I got help from communities and so many people came to help me. That really encouraged me a lot. The wiki page mailing list of community groups, they are so common. What's more, I got a lot of help from the South Code contributors. So I feel that that is the real open source project. And in China, we have 1, 000, more than 1,800 people, group, QQ group, and uh, all of them are focused on open delight. We discuss a lot about, about the technical things in this group. And the second point is, I think open delight is evolving. Uh, I launched a user survey in 2015, and the, the documentation was the highest demand. So many people complain about the documentation problems. And uh, I know that Colin really did a lot of work on this point. And he, he sent me two links uh, about this point. I attach it in the bottom of this slide. I think it helps me a lot, so I, I would like to share it with others. And you can see that today the documentation problem is much better, and so many new features are added in the open daylight. The performance is improved at the same time. I still remember that the, the first release uh, hydrogen, it is hard to push a flow table into the switch. The consistency between config data store and the operational data store is hard to achieve. But just a few days ago, I tried it on the Barrelium release and it works uh, quite a well. And uh, the last one I have to see, I want to speak is as a platform you can find, or at least you will find what you want. The multiple plugins, especially the southbound plugins, it reduced the extra work of uh, protocol realization, which really great for me. And uh, the northbound or other features are uh, great too. Then I want to explain how I learned to use open data. So many uh, friends ask me about this because so many students want to get to use open data, but they don't know how. And for me, the beginning is wiki page. And then I want to mention the YouTube because I learned young model from the YouTube and it really helped me a lot then I think you should join in the community. When you join the community, you get the uh, sharing from it and the, you help others, others help you. So you feel that you are a member of the Open Daylight community. So you are not alone, you will go on working on it. Then I think Young Model is the soul of Open Daylight. Uh, it is a tree-like standardized data model, so many people think it is really good. Uh, for me, if I want to read a source code of a new project, I will find the young model first. Uh, the 
the data data young model you can find the, the structure of data store so you use the generated the Java Java field to uh, jump into the implementation so you can get the threads so you can know how does this protocol implement it. And at the same time, RPC uh, is a, a service, service uh, young model, so uh, as a, as a, they work in the same, same way for me to read the source code of, of open daylight. Then I think we have to keep learning because the rapidly growing project, uh, open daylight just uh, evolving so fast. And uh, the last one, I want to know, to talk about what I learned from open daylight. The first time I touched the open daylight, I just uh, don't have a sense of what is ISDN, what is open flow, and uh, what is a controller. But after developing open daylight, I know what I did in the past exactly. And uh, what's more, as an experience on it, I know the difference between a product and a platform. I think it is easy for us to develop a customized controller, uh, you you don't care care about the other environment, uh, uh, network environment. You just uh, specify it. it. It is easy, but I I think it is really hard to build a general platform. And I learned it from. Um, our project in our, li our life. Right? So if you want to build a general platform, you have to think about the general network statement and also the interface designs and uh, something else. It is really complex. And uh, at this point, I think OpenDAT really did a good job. And you can see that the Dualex uh, UI it improved the, the performance and uh, provide us a general idea of the underlying networks. And I really like it. Then I want to say, because of open data, I know what is open source. Uh, maybe I, I cannot uh, speak it exactly, but all of these are my feelings. Open source, that is, you can work together. No one is your boss. You can propose your idea and discuss it with others. And we share our ideas and share experience. We just work together to, to forward the things uh, that is really good for me to learn a lot from it. Then I want to talk about what is open daylight in my eyes. Basically, open daylight is a ISIN controller. Definitely it is. And it is an open source project. And it is a network system. All of these are right, I think, but for me, Open that is not a secret. Um, as there is a parents in the open data community in China, there are still a lot of people stay outside of open delight. Maybe that is because the translation problem, maybe that is because uh, uh, it is complex or something else. Then we have community to organize some sharing activities to help people to get into open data. But I think the effect is still not very great. And uh, many people think that open data it is hard to, to develop. And I, I feel that some people uh, maybe they don't want to 
share a share a lot about it. I'm not sure, but I think it is a, an open source project. I got a lot of help from it. I would like to help other people. So I encourage people just to try it. Just uh, do it, do not think um, of a lot about it, and uh, you can get uh, help from the community. Don't uh, stop doing it. And uh, these are the activities held in China. I engaged them a lot, and really helps me a lot. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Robert Mullins, and I'm here to give you an overview on the Cognac project. Um, it's a European research project. Um, it's funded under a, um, a program called the 5G PPP, or the Fifth Generation uh, Public-Private Partnership, the objective of which is to uh, basically fund uh, research programs around 5G technology and uh, there's approximately 15 different projects running at the moment, all with slightly different themes. Uh, the specific one that I'm talking about is about cognitive network management. It's a um, pretty substantial project. There's an overall budget of about 6 million euro, which would be equivalent to about $7 million. It's been running since July 2015, and it'll run until December 2017. Uh, the various partners, uh, there's a good lineup of partners. There's ourselves, my organization, which is Waterford Institute of Technology. I'm the coordinator of the project. IBM, Nokia, Telefonica, Orange Labs, Fraunhofer Focus, which are a major NGN, next generation network research group in Europe. And also there's a number of universities and research groups also. Um, I won't list them all out. There's not but five or six in total. Um, so. This plays in a little bit with um, what uh, David Marr was talking about yesterday, because uh, I know David previously, this, the connection, that's why I'm kind of here, whatever. Um, he, he found out a little bit about the project through some mutual acquaintances, and we ended up having a chat together, and there's a lot of overlap of interest and whatever. So, uh, so what is machine learning? Um, well, machine learning is a kind of a, a technology based around the processing of big data. And the idea is that it allows software to self-adapt. So the software can actually dynamically adjust its behavior in response to the environment. Um, and this adaptation is done via a, uh, an intelligent function. And that can automatically select the appropriate type of uh, functionality to use according to the environment. Um, some of the... Machine learning is also, it's a little bit like a heuristic insofar as that in some cases what you're actually dealing with is, is a very complex optimization function. Um, but often that's not quite, the whole parameters of that aren't quite well understood and it's, it's just too complex to, um, to actually com fully compute in real time. So machine learning often gives you a kind of a, a set of kind of rules which you can use to, uh, to, to process without actually having to analyze in real time. Okay, so what is Cognit about? Well, it's about applying machine learning to network management. Uh, a number of different use cases. Uh, some of these use cases are based around the use of, we say, network data, but also non-network data, and this is where it gets kind of novel. So, for example, we're looking at data that has been gathered through social media, and that can be used. So what we're trying to do, uh, some of the use cases are around demand prediction. Now, demand prediction isn't ex exactly new. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's possible to demand what are the particular uh, levels of services according to time of day, day of week, time of month, location, how that changes over time. But what is slightly different is the, the whole idea of kind of outlier events, exceptional events. So what happens when there's a, a very large rock concert or there's a football match or there's a political event or there's a royal wedding or something like this, right? And demand peaks at those particular times. So one of the things we're looking at is how can you predict those types of scenarios? And one of the things we're looking at is the use of social media and mining data from social media. Uh, we have an ongoing experiment at the moment where we're mining from Twitter. 
we've got a collection of network data in the greater New York area over the period of uh, July 2016 to December 2016. And we're running that collection of demand data against predictions made via mining Twitter. Um, and we can compare the two side by side so we can see whether the social media is an accurate predictor of actual demand. Uh, it should be very interesting to see what the results of that are, and that's going on within the project. Uh, we're also looking at applying machine learning to um, historic data patterns um, from the network. So, for example, we're looking at how would you predict a uh, node or a VNF going into a false state? How would you um, predict uh, problems such as congestion in the network? Is there some signature in the data patterns leading up to that that might allow you to predict this? Um, the other things we're looking at is security issues. So, for example, if there's a denial of service or a man-in-the-middle attack on a network, is there some pattern in the data that can actually allow you to uh, differentiate between, we say, a denial of service attack versus just a peak in demand? an unusual peak in demand. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to create uh, policies to allow preemptive action uh, to these types of situations rather than reacting to them. So prevent the problem rather than fix the problem. OK, so where does Cognit sit? Um, here's a fairly high level overview of where it sits in relation to a lot of the different parts of the network. So here you can see the, the, the NFEI infrastructure, the MANO stack here with the orchestrator, the VNFM, the VIM, the SDN controller, and where does Cognit? So Cognit is basically there controlling uh, uh, these entities and in effect managing the network via these particular um, entities. So some of it is sitting, depending on the use case, some of it may sit in this autonomic uh, network management system. Other parts may actually sit in the actual network orchestrator or in the VNFM. But we would see ourselves having a, a, a very strong link, and that's where those blue arrows, that we can link in with these particular entities in the network. And as you can see, the SDN controller is a, a fundamental part of that. OK, so how do we do policy management? Well, we've got sets of, of um, machine learning models. Uh, this is not meant to be a, com a complete set, but it's, it's just an example. So we've got different models, some of them uh, illustrating predicted demand, others fault prediction, others anomaly detection, others user behavior models. And in turn, we've got different sets of policy managers. One is looking at network provisioning, another at fault tolerance, another at network QoS monitor. But there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between these, because while some of the, the policy managers will use a specific model to inform them, some of them may use several. Okay? Um, and the other thing as well is that it's the, the, what we're looking at is a mixture. It's not exclusively machine learning informed. So there may be traditional approaches, traditional deterministic approaches used to management, but combined with machine learning. Okay, so how can an actual machine learning model inform policy? Um, so I have an example here where you've got basically a probability matrix. So you've got a number of nodes and over time, using a logarithmic time scale, you've got a prediction of that node entering a fail state. Okay? And typically, the, the probability would increase over time. But we can use that type of matrix, which could be built using by examining uh, historical data okay? and leading into various different states. We can work out whether a data signature from that node indicates its likelihood to enter into a fail state. And here we're writing some code to implement a policy to handle that failure state. So we're looking, we're just iterating through all the nodes and we're saying if the probability within two minutes of it entering a fail state is greater than 0 0.7, then create a new standby for that node. But if the probability within 10 seconds of it going into a fail state goes over 0 0.9, then we actually do a switch over. Okay? So that's just an example of a simple policy. Um, and that's the most basic level at which we might use machine learning to do network management. So we can move it up a little gear though here, where we're actually saying now, 
that rather than just using the model in a raw uh, way, what we're doing here is we're actually using machine learning also to set the thresholds. So through, uh, through analysis, we can say that in actual fact, the optimum approach here is to actually use 10 minutes a probability of greater than 0 0.75 and then do the switch over under a 30 second window if the probability goes over 0 0.85. So that's slightly different than the previous settings, which you can see there. But what we have done here is we've used a machine learning algorithm to actually dynamically set the thresholds at which the policy is applied. But I think that is probably about the scope that we can hope to maybe get to in Cognat. But here is where we would really like to get to. So we would use machine learning to actually create and evaluate policies. So instead of just using the, the, the machine learning model to execute the policy, we're actually generating the policy. And then we're using a reinforcement learning algorithm. And we're feeding that the network key performance indicators. And they will indicate the success or otherwise of the policy. So where a new policy is de being deployed, if that is improving the network KPIs, then that policy is left in place or it's, or it's improved over time. But where one is actually disimproving the network KPIs, then that can be abandoned or it can be suppl supplanted by a new policy. Um, so how are we creating and describing policies? Well, we're making use of a language called SUPA, which is the Simplified Use of Policy Abstractions. This is an emerging IETF standard, and it's a, it's, some of you might have heard of intent-based networking. It's a very abstract description of what you want your policy to achieve um, without actually mandating the uh, underlying semantics of how it's achieved. But if we take something like that in the context of uh, a system such as Cognat, we can actually run it through a co-generator. And uh, the super is encoded in Yang. So there's, there's already lots of co-generators out there uh, that can actually translate Yang into Java. But we can embellish them with Cognat functionality. So it generates a specific policy that is encoded using uh, Cognate framework. So for example, we may have a, a network management framework uh, developed in Java, or we might have a, a machine learning framework. And the generated code will actually use that framework code uh, to integrate with the system. So in a lot of ways, it's, it's not a million miles from the way open data works. Uh, and here's an example. There. So on the left, there's a, an example of a very, very simple policy uh, written in SUPA. And on the right-hand side, the actual Java code that is generated when you run it through the, the translator. And there's obvious um, advantages to doing this way because it simplifies the development and it means that anyone who actually, you know, that you don't necessarily need to understand the uh, detailed internals of Cognet to actually use it. Um, and you can also create something like a, an Eclipse plugin that can actually generate this for you. Um, there's still a certain amount of hand coding uh, required at the moment. So for example, the actual actions that you want. So when you can generate the, the event condition triggering, but you will have to hand code the actions that you want at the moment. Okay, so, and what's the link with open daylight? Well, I believe that there's a lot of um, synergy between what we're doing in Cognit and open daylight, not least the fact that a lot of the management of the network could be done via open daylight. So for example, we're using Yang uh, to uh, cover super specifications. We're generating Java from that uh, to, with the specific Cognate bindings. We're also thinking of using OSGI as the deployment for the actual policies to run in. Um, we could generate auto integration with, through the open data.md cell for the get set of the VNF configuration state info. And um, I actually believe that we, it might be a good idea to actually create a Cognate cognitive network management project within open data around Cognit, and we could reuse a lot of the work that we're doing in that. So um, just one other thing I just want to draw attention. I'm sorry all the students or the interns uh, moved out because I wanted to get their attention on this, that um, we have an opening on the project for an MSc student. Uh, it's a two-year position. There's an 18,000 euro stipend tax-free per annum for that. And um, 
we would certainly be interested in anyone who has already worked on Open Daylight because they could reuse their experience and their knowledge of that in the project. Um, and as, uh, as you can see, it's not a million miles away from Open Daylight, what some of the stuff that we, they would be doing. Uh, so if you know anyone who might be interested, it's in Waterford, so it's in Ireland. Yeah. And there would be a possibility then to, to go further and do a PhD as well. So thank you, and if you have any questions. Uh, they, they could do, um, we haven't really gone down that route yet. Uh, at the moment we're trying to do the machine learning uh, just based on fairly simple um, use of libraries existing, you know, Java libraries and stuff like that. But in a kind of, if you were to look at this in a big deployed network scenario, uh, the, the computing power to actually create the models might be something that needs that kind of a solution or even you know, uh, some of the ones from Google, um, what's it called again? Um, TensorFlow. You know, that's probably what we would actually use to, to generate the models. There's a different step between the actual use of the machine learning models, which happens in real time, and the actual generation of them. So even if the model takes a month to crunch through and generate, we could still use it in real time. You know, so it's a two-step process. Uh, not at the moment, no, but it is, it is, uh, it's my plan that we do start doing that. Um, we're, we're, we're building an integration environment where we can, you know, we've got a lot of, we're, we're, we're using a lot of stuff like OPNFE as part of that. Um, and it would be my intention to use Open Daylight and to use that as a, a management interface. I haven't. I haven't. Not yet. Would you like to? Yeah, sure, absolutely, yeah. Um, you're familiar with the Yang IDE that they have, right? Um, no, my familiarity with Yang at this stage would be limited to P Yang, the actual uh, code generator from that. But yeah, I mean, I know there's, there's probably better tools out there for using that. One of the things we're working on is. Okay. Oh, yeah, you were talking about it at the, the keynote there yesterday. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I would be very, very interested in that. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that if we did have an intern in, that's the kind of work he would be, he would be doing. And we certainly would be interested in finding out what's the latest uh, happening in that area before we actually do embark on the work, you know. Yeah, sure. Very interested in that, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, hydrogen, it, it's hard to push a flow table into the switch. The consistency between config data store and the operational data store is hard to achieve. But just a few days ago, I tried it on the barrel layer release, and it works uh, quite a well. And uh, the last one I, to see, I want to speak is, as a platform, you can find, or at least you will find what you want. The multiple plugins, especially the southbound plugins, it reduced the extra work of uh, protocol a realization which really great for me. Documentation was the highest demand. So many people complain about the documentation problems. And uh, I know that Colin really did a lot of work on this point. And he, he sent me two links uh, about this point. I attach it in the bottom of this slice. I think it helps me a lot, so I, I would like to share it with others. And you can see that today the documentation problem is much better, and so many new features are added in the open daylight. The performance is improved at the same time. I still remember that the, the first release 
the, all community community groups, they are so common. What's more, I got a lot of help from the South Code contributors. So I feel that that is the real open source project. And in China, we have 1,000, more than 1,800 people, group, QQ group, and uh, all of them are focused on open delight. We discuss a lot about, about the technical things in this group. And the second point is, I think open delight is evolving. Uh, I launched a, a user survey in 2015, and uh, the Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ming Ming Chen. I'm from China. Um, I feel really honored to give this talk here. And I would like to introduce my user experience on open delight. Here's the content. And I just want to show how I used Open Delight and uh, what I feel from Open Delight. First, why I chose Open Delight and why I insist on Open Delight. Actually, I was chosen. I didn't choose Open Delight. The first time I used Open Delight is because of project. My supervisor arranged me to develop Open Delight. I was really driven crazy. As you know that the first release, Hydrogen, um, it is not user-friendly. Uh, but you see that today, I stand here and try to convince people to use Open Delight. So what happened? I got help from communities, and so many people came to help me. That's really encouraged me a lot. The wiki page mainly 